Yep. Oh, let's do it like this. We'll figure it out. Facebook doesn't like it. All right. There you go. Well, good morning, everybody. Hopefully, we're going to start a watch party for a minute. I already did. You already did. You man. Uh, good to see everybody. Anyway, you can look at it. But um, good to see everybody out this morning. We've had a little technical difficulties with our microphones and trying to get stuff set up. And hopefully, you can hear us now. And uh, we're going to jump into our uh, morning to coffee in the Word. Hopefully, you got your Word. Yeah, right hopefully, you got your coffee. Heard me now. I hear myself on my phone. Yeah. But, but uh, get your coffee, get your word, get you a good place to sit. We are jumping into a little series. We started it last week. We, uh, it's called Seven Churches. And we're talking about the seven churches in Asia that Paul wrote to while he was on the Isle of Patmos, while he was in, in, the, at the, in the days, at the day of the Lord. In the days of the Lord's day, he encountered Christ and got a vision. And we talked about that last week. But with all that being said, let's don't forget tonight's service at 7 o'clock. Our pastor is bringing forth the word. He'll be here. And, um, so remember that. Also remember uh, just a few reminders about our service and things that's going on. We have an early service. It starts at 8.15 in the, I, I retitled it. I hope you like the title, but I call it our multi-purpose sanctuary. <laughs> so if you don't know who that is, let us know. We'll point you in the right direction. It starts at 8.15. Uh, we call it multi-purpose because the early service is in there, the youth have their service in there, the Hispanic church has their service in there, and uh, so it's a, it's a multi-purpose uh, facility. But anyway, it starts at 8.15. Hey, if you, if you, let me say this about the early service. If you're getting off work, going to work, come on and join us. You, you ain't got to dress up and be fancy, just come on and uh, be part of the service. But uh, remember those, we got our 10.30 worship, we've got 9.30 Sunday school, we got 6 o'clock worship. So remember those days on Sundays. Don't forget coming up, we've got Encounter uh, Night of Worship. It's next Sunday, I believe it is, is the 20th. It's the 20th, that evening service at six o'clock. Uh, so don't forget uh, to come out and be part of that. But let's, let's, uh, let's pray, let's invite the Lord into this service. Hey, uh, just, just to bring this up, this came up while I was gone. Um, and, and it was kind of funny that, that it happened this way. And, and, and I want to do this before we pray because I want to pray about this too. Um, and, and we need you, you all to help on this because this, this is a church thing. It's not just, just a pastor thing. It's not an assistant or me or anybody else. This is a church thing. Did you know that some of our leadership didn't know that we was doing this? I was doing Facebook already. Yeah. Some of the leadership didn't know that we was doing this. And some of the leadership didn't know we had a connection class. Oh, wow. Okay? Uh, all right. And, and what I want to do is I want to make sure that every single person invites others to do some of these things with us. Right. You know, um, meet somebody in, in Walmart, Kmart. Well, Kmart's not around anymore. It just shows you how old I am. But if you see it, you know, but go ahead. Stop that. <laughs> hey, you, you can get coffee in the Word and entertainment too. How about that? Uh, but tell your friends and your family and your other people that, that you meet here in church. Let them know what we're doing here. The 815 is, is just an early service in, extend, in extension of what we do in the 1030. You know, we, we need every to know what we're doing inside our church, right. you know, from beginning to end of, of what each and every class is about. Right. And we, you know, just exactly what uh, Brother Philip and myself are doing here, we need to make sure everybody knows uh, uh, what we're doing, what uh, uh, Buffy and Brian are doing in their classroom. Let everybody know. Pass it around. Make sure that uh, uh, if you're excited about what your class is doing, let somebody know because right. it, it's how we grow. And that's a good point. Right? And I forgot the connection class we are. It's uh, taking in new members. We'll be taking them the 27th of this month. But we have a connection class which tells us we kind of get to know you and you kind of get to know us. It's uh, what we believe, who we are, and then your uh, connection profile, which deals with your gifts and your talents and some spiritual gifts. It does start this Sunday morning at 9.30. We're meeting in the uh, older sanctuary building. The, if you come into the side door, it's a class all the way down in the corner. Uh, if you, we'll be there if you can't find it. We'll be somebody there to direct you. But uh, if you want to be, if you want to become a member here at Mount Bell, uh, pass that along. 
So, uh, and don't forget uh, two pass. Don't forget to start your watch parties. And, and can I say this before we jump in? I know we're taking a little time here, but I want you to understand you guys are what make this class possible outside of God himself who gives us the, the ability to do this. But you, this is an online uh, Bible study class. We want comments, we, we questions. Jerry helps fill those and Melissa helps fill those. And, and we, well, that's what we want. It's interactive, I guess is the word I'm trying to use. So uh, don't forget, pass it along. Amen. Uh, any further questions you can think of? Remember Brother Gary uh, Canada. He's, he's, he's having some health issues, so please remember him and pray for him. Darren. Darren uh, King, yeah, remember yeah. him. He's having some health issues. Uh, let's remember him. Uh, and you, it, those that are, hey, let me say this. If you belong to the church and you are a member or if you're coming, uh, you can go to our church center app. There's a lot of information on that. Don't forget if you've got any questions about that, you can see us or you can text uh, or connect or however you do it on Facebook. Sister Melissa will help you and guide you right through it. If you've got any questions on how to get on that. So remember some of those things. Do you have anything else for me? No, that's it. I, well, I'm ready to go. I'm falling apart over here. Anyway, <laughs> my my is just doing its own thing. But uh, So let's remember a few of those. Let's remember our service tonight. I, I'm, I'm hanging on to this little thought little girl prayed the other day up here. We had a great service Sunday night or Sunday morning. We had a fair friends and family day. Thanks for all those who came out and participated. We had a great turnout, a great time, and just fun and fellowships. They had blow-ups, they had cornhole tournament, they had hot, all the foods you wanted to eat, hot dogs, hamburgers, and I don't eat desserts, but they had a table full of them. So, <laughs> so but anyway, just uh, just remember those. Thank you for everybody who worked in that, participated in that. But remember tonight's service. What I was going to say is remember that I like this little thought. We had a great service Sunday morning, but God, just make it better this. Make it a better service tonight. How many know we need a greater outpouring of God in these times than we ever have in, in, our, in my lifetime? But anyway, with all that being said, let's pray and we'll jump into our lesson this morning. Father, we come to you today, God, giving you thanksgiving and praise. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and your loving kindness. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing for us, Father God. And Lord, we ask you to move right now, God, upon our services tonight, God. Move upon our singers and musicians. Anoint them, Father God. Anoint our pastors. He brings forth the word tonight, Father Lord. And Lord, we ask you, God, right now to begin to move, prepare the way in the hearts of the people that are coming today, God. Give them ears to hear what your word has to say, Lord. And Lord, move in this class today, Father God. Anoint me, your son and your servant, God. God, speak to me and through me, not of the wisdom of men, but divine power and revelation of the Holy Ghost, God. Let us grow in the knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, God. Let us learn and glean from your scriptures and from your word, Father God. And God, we ask you, God, right now to anoint us right now, this very moment, this very hour, this very second for this time, Father Lord. And God, we ask you to move upon Brother Gary, upon Brother Darren, God, and upon all those who's put out prayer requests throughout the week, Father God. We ask you to move and touch in their lives, Father Lord. And Lord, we ask God that you move in a mighty, powerful way, Lord. We ask it in your name, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We jumped into a new series last week. We left the series, the, Is This the End? and kind of rolled on over into part of the end, I guess, in itself. But we, we're into studying the seven churches that Paul wrote to. In Revelation 1 and 11, and and, and, and well, you could just go one and ten. Paul's on the isle, or John, excuse me, is on the Isle of Patmos, and he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see is right in the book and send it into the seven churches which are in Asia. We talked last week about some of the representations of what was taking place in verse in chapter one, and now we're jumping into one of the churches this morning. And and, and I like to say this because I, here's what I want us to glean out of these scriptures. We understand first and foremost that these churches were real churches. Geographically, they were there at that time. And Paul, or John, excuse me, is writing to these churches at what Christ has given him. And secondly, we look at them as a, they call it the dispensational interpretation. They call it, it's the place of the church as it travels through history, the whole body of, the, of Christ and believers. And they call it the church age and it moves through these churches and and we'll begin to see how we could almost see as we get closer to the latter parts of them where we are as a church in general 
uh, not just the church of God, not just Baptist, but every born again believer, the church, amen, the church of the living God. And then thirdly, I think all scripture is for, is for reproof, is for correction, is for sound doctrine, is that we can apply to ourselves. And here, what I want us to do as people is to see where, where we are in our walk with the Lord. Are we, are we like the church of Ephesus? Are we like the church of Laodicea? Are we like this church in our walk with the Lord and see where we are spiritually in our spiritual walk with the Lord? So with all that being said, let's read uh, Revelations chapter 2, uh, verse 1. And as you're turning there, I should have told you that, but I was going to get me some coffee as you're turning there. <laughs> but Revelations chapter 2, starting at verse 1, and, and I kind of passed that out uh, last week, and, and next week we'll, I'll tell you what passages of Scripture we'll begin to study. So uh, let's just read. It said, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Verse 1 says this, and this is the church of Ephesus. And he says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith but he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. I want to talk about Ephesus. Look at the Jerry. Ephesus, I couldn't get it out. If you will, it's right to and talk to. There's three things I want us to look at in this. If you see it, 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 it's in all of them. He said, I know thy works. And God also gives a promise, or Christ does, to him that overcometh. And each ends with he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. You also see at the beginning of these letters to these churches, you see that the title of our Lord, if you will, the title of Jesus in each case accords with the nature, if you will, of what he was in verse chapter 1. And, and, and it's an imagery, if you will, of Revelations 1, 12 through 16 of what Christ was and, or what John saw him to be. But I want you to look at the church of Ephesus. Ephesus, just for a moment, just a little historical background of him or ge geographical background. It, it was a church in the ancient world. Ephesus was a center of travel and commerce. It was a big port town, if you will. It was situated on the Aegean Sea at the mouth of the Castier River. The city was one of the greatest seaports of the ancient world. They say there was three major roads that led out of that city. It was uh, from the seaport. One road went west towards Babylon via Laodicea, another to the north via Smyrna, Smyrna and the third south to the Meander Valley. And we see that, that, that Ephesus was a, you gotta, you gotta, I'm trying to paint a picture here. Ephesus was a metropolitan town. It was at one time termed as the light of Asia. It was the first, or termed the first city of Asia. It was a, it was where the Roman uh, seat, if you will, in that area of Asia was. It was the Roman capital for that Asia, uh, part of Asia that they had conquered at that time. It was, it was a big metropolis. It was a seaport. People were coming and going, and goods were coming and going. Uh, I, I think about some of the big cities here in, in our country. New York could be comparable, maybe, or San Francisco, or places that has big seaport areas in New Orleans and things where roads just travel out and multiple different people in there. Ephesus was also famed for the Temple of Diana and it was one of the seven wonders of the world. And, and when we hear that for three years, Paul labored, if you will, or preached in that area and set up that church and he put Timothy in charge of it for a short period. We don't believe Timothy was in charge of it at this time. But the fact of the matter is, we see that Paul worked through it. And it was, a, like I said, the Temple Diana. Remember in Acts where Paul and them was preaching in Ephesus. And, and, and the guy said, and there was a manufacturer. Let me back up. There was a great uh, economy there that made idols of Diana. And that's how they made their money. They sold them to travelers coming and going. And the thing about it is, is that Paul was preaching and people were getting saved. And some of them craftsmen got upset. And they'd taken his livelihood. Remember, they had him. They had him brought before all those people and thrown in prison or all that because 
of the princess Di or the god the, the goddess Diana of the, of the Roman um, um, fake god, if you will. But we see that Paul established this church, and Paul worked there. They estimated for about three years in this area. And now we see that Jesus is beginning to tell us. He says, he says to this church Ephesus, just to give you a little geographical background there. He said, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hands. We talked about that last week. The seven stars represent the seven ministers, the seven bishops, the seven pastors, if you will, over those church churches. And I think it's important right here just to put this. If you're a pastor and you're watching, understand this. Jesus is holding you. He said, I holdeth the stars. He's got you tied in his grip. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows where your church is at. He knows in this pandemic, but I want you to this. The Greek, uh, or the Greek translation of this holdeth means to hold fast. He's holding on to you. So don't everything for a moment that you're out there by yourself. Your church may be struggling in the midst of this. There may be a schisms and isms in it, but understand this, Christ is holding the pastors and he's Amen. holding the bishops this morning. So that's for pastors and bishops out there. Understand this. And ministers of God, understand this, Christ holds the seven stars. He's holding on to these men of God who he's chosen to shepherd his flock, who he's chosen to, to feed the lambs, if you will. He's got you in his right hand. And I think that's important because that right hand represents power. That right hand it represents security in the, in the Old Testament or in the biblical times. The right hand was a place of honor and a place of authority. So understand this, Christ has got you in his right hand this morning. I don't know who that's for. Maybe you're a pastor and you want to share it. Some of your pastors don't understand this. He holds you. He holds you in the midst of the trials, midst of everything that seems like it's going around you. And, and, and so pastors understand that this morning. And he says, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. <clears throat> Last week we talked about the golden candlesticks represents the church. And, it, and, and we understand that we're the light bearers. We're not, a candlestick cannot, just to back up a little bit, the candlestick cannot bring forth light. It just holds the light. And we as the church are to be the city on the hill. We as the church are to be the light. The light is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The light is the spirit of God. It's, it's fueled by the spirit of God, if you will. And we're the light bearers. But I think what's important here is he says, I'm in the midst. Understand this, Christ is in the midst of this pandemic in the church. Christ is in the midst of this, this upheaval in this land and in, in, in the church. Understand this church, folks, if you're watching today, and, and, and maybe this is for ministers too, but the thing about it is, let me say this about churches. The church will never cease to exist until, until Christ calls us all home. The church will never cease to exist until Christ calls us all home. And he's in the midst of our churches. He's walking to and from. He's here, in, he's here in Jefferson City, Tennessee, as well as he is out in California where they're struggling with with, with, with limited, uh, I call it persecution. I don't know what else to call it, where they're persecuting them, not allowing them to assemble, but they allow restaurants to open up. But understand this, if you're in California and you're watching, or if you're in Texas or wherever you're at, understand this, Christ is in the midst of his people. He never leaves us. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst. Amen. Got comments, questions? No. Um. I just want to remind everybody this this is an open Bible study. Please ask any questions, participate just as though you were here. Right, amen. <clears throat> All right, chapter verse two. We're gonna move here, I guess. Now, understand this. We see the picture of Christ. We see him holding the pastors, we see him in the midst of the church. And he's writing to a place that, that had a economical uh area, if you will, of, of great commerce and great, all kinds of people coming in and coming out and all kinds of lifestyles. And I thought about it, it was kind of ironic. They were in the middle of a place that worshiped a false goddess to the point that they made such a great temple in its day that it was considered as one of the seven wonders of the world. And that's a, you think about it, can, can I say this? Sometimes we as Christians and we're at our workplace and we feel like we're the only Christians there, there may be a purpose for that. You may be the only light that they see. You may be the only, uh, uh, you may be the only gospel they'll ever hear. And I thought about that. What a what a great place to be. Sometimes we we want to be where everybody's Christians and everybody loves each other. But the fact of the matter is, God sent these people to set this church in Ephesus yeah, so amen. that those people could be reached. Multicultures come in and out of there. If you ever been to the seaport area or in big cities, there's multiple cultures. There's multiple. Ethnicities, I guess, or races, races, and all kinds of uh, uh, people from different worlds and different countries come into those areas because of what it, the commerce that it brings in. And here's Paul has established this church, and here's this church now 
and, and Jesus begins to talk to them and tell them about who they are. I thought it was probably, what, what wouldn't you think of a church when, uh, when they got the letter that they could read what Christ had, and John's way off on an island somewhere. Hadn't been there probably months, maybe years. And all of a sudden he's writing about what's going on. You know it had to come from God. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, but that was troubling in itself. But here's something that's important. Verse two, it says, I know thy works. Uh-oh. <laughs> Christ says this, I know thy works. I think it's important that we understand this. Jesus knows all the good and the evil that is going on right now. He knows everything that you're doing and he knows everything that the enemy's doing. Think of how weighty those words are just for a moment. He says, I know he knows what you're doing in the midnight hour. He knows what you're doing at two or three o'clock in the morning. He knows what you're doing when you go to work and how you act at work. He knows what you're thinking. He knows He knows why you laid out of church last Sunday morning. My pastor, give me a thumbs up on that one. <laughs> he knows. He knows what your thoughts are. Don't, and and, and that's a, that's, that ought to be a, 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 I don't know the word to use, but it is, it, it's a, it's a, it's a weighty thing to think that Christ knows everything you do, think, or say. Whether anybody, he knows when you're at the house by yourself what you're doing. He knows what you're doing when you go off to school. He knows what you're, you're doing when you're not at church. He even knows what you're doing when you're at church. He, he Think about it. Think, and if you're doing wrong, it's a dreadful thought that Christ knows everything. He's all seeing, all knowing. We know that. But to those that, that how think about it, even if, if you're doing good, it's a sweet sound. It's a sweet thought. He knows what I'm doing. He knows that I love him. He knows that I'm worshiping. He knows. But here's what I want us to get a hold of. He knew the works of this church and he knows the works of us. And I think that's a weighty word, if you will. He says, I know. I know every thought. I know everything. I know what you said about your pastor. I know what you said about the deacons. I know what you said about your wife. I know what you said about your husband. I know what you think. A scary. It ought to make us live closer to the Lord. Amen. Jerry even got quiet on that one. Nah. <laughs> I'm just sitting here thinking about the... the you think about what he did on vacation? No. Nah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm thinking about the scripture where it says the impure thoughts. Sure. Impure thoughts. Christ knows everything. We, let me say this, we, we've seen it, we joke around about it, but the preacher comes up, over to the house, knocks on the door, we hide everything. Christ already knew what you were doing. Juan Morton says, all darkness shall come to light. There you go. That's right. All darkness Amen, shall says. come to light. That's right. Amen. It, it, what, what's, what, hey, the Bible teaches that. It says, what's hid in the dark will be brought to the light. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely right. And that's a, that's a thought that we got to hold on to is he knows thy works. And, and you see that throughout these churches. And, and that's something we've got to understand in our own life and our own thing, that Jesus, one day it'll, it's going to sound dreadful to the wicked. And one day it's going to sound sweet to the righteous. Think about this. One day we're going to stand before God and he's going to say, either depart from me for I never knew you or enter in to a place of rest, enter into the kingdom of heaven with me. It's because he knows your works. Come on. He, he knows if you've got your faith right with him. He knows if you've been washed in the blood, if you will. But he says, I know thy works. Well, this is what he was teaching out of the church. You know, yeah. There was one that he was not pleased with. Am I not correct? There's a few he's got some. And, 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 yeah. and then now look at, at the churches. How many is he not pleased with? Sure. I, and he's right. He knows what you're doing. He churches, he knows what you're doing. That's fine. He knows what we're doing here and out there. He knows the works that we're doing. The Bible teaches us that one day we'll give an account for in, in what in before God what we've done in this body, whether it's good or bad, and even as a body of Christ. Now here, Kim, let's, let's move here a little bit. Even as a body of Christ, are we after what he's after? Do we have a passion for what he has a passion for? Do we treat people like he would treat people? Can I say this? I seen a church sign the other day, and I, and I and it really think about it. It said, mirror, mirror on the wall. Can you see Jesus in me at all? Ooh. I'm gonna let that just stay with you. We're gonna move on. But think about it. He knows thy works. He knows what you're doing. He, and he goes on to say, he said, I know thy labors. He knows what you're doing and he knows what you're not doing. And, and I think that's important. And, and I want you to look at these things that Jesus is beginning to tell this church. He says, I know thy works. He said, I know thy labor. He said, I and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And how thou hast tried them which, are, which say they're apostles and are not and hast found them liars. And has borne and has patience. And for my.
He's named, these are some good qualities of the church. These are some good qualities of men and women of God. These are some good things. And we see it here, if you will, by labor, if you will, are, are named out in three particulars. And first is, 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 to, is to describe by labor. It's good to labor for the Lord. We talked about that in one of the uh, end time messages about how you're not to hide your talents or your gifts. And you, you read that passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 25. It's right after the 10 virgins parable. You go into the talents parable and he said, I gave some five and some two. I gave one five, one two, and one one, one I guess. And, and the five and the two did something with us, but the one went and hid his in the earth. And when the, when the master came back, he said he was an unprofitable servant. And, and he knows thy labor. Understand this, you need to be laboring before the Lord in thy patience. How many knows we got to have patience with each other? I'm just gonna let that settle. <laughs> uh, I know I get on Jerry's nerves sometimes, but you gotta have patience with me. And, and I know that. And, 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 and see that, he says, and how thou canst not bear evil men. Let me say that right there. And, and my grandson, we was talking the other night and he's right, he, we were talking about certain sins and he says, he says, you know, I don't agree with that. He said, but I know we're, we're not to hate, we're, we're to hate the sin and not the sinner itself. We're to hate what they do, but not them. And, and that's what it's saying here. I want to say this to churches and church members. Can I say this? Sometimes we get so accustomed to the evil of this world, it doesn't bother us anymore. Amen. The Bible says there's a point. I, I can't remember the scripture off the top of my head, but it says we don't blush anymore. Yeah. There's some things on TV that would turn our stomachs two years ago, and now we just watch it like it ain't nothing. Because we've become accustomed to it, and it becomes the norm. And the culture and the society and the world feeds us through television, through social media, through entertainment, that all this is okay. And every, it's a normal act, and it's a normal practice. But here it teaches that, about, can I say this, and, and, and I think you gotta do it in love, but I think a church has to be like this church that you cannot bear the evil. You've got to preach against the sin. You've got to teach against the sin. You've got to stand on some sound doctrine. And I believe this church was at this moment. At this time, he's given some good things what they did. Christians, hear me today. If you're at work, you don't laugh at the dirty jokes and you don't look at the dirty things on the internet with those people. Amen. Okay. He says, you, you, he says this, you, he's naming some great things you're doing. You're laboring, you got patience and you can't bear the evil and you says, and he goes on to say, and he has tried them who say they're apostles and they are not and have found them liars. That word tried, I think is important. He says, you, you've experimented, if you will. The, the Greek word for that is you've tested them. How many know in everything that, that glitters is not gold? Everything, everybody that says, how can I be this and do this kind of, Everything that acts spiritual is not spiritual. Uh, you got to try people. The Bible teaches us in John, 1 John 4 and 1, it said, Beloved, believe not every spirit. One, one, one scripture says, You need to know those who labor among you. Come on. How many has ever been to a church service and, and, and the Lord's moving and all of a sudden somebody, act, I don't say acts out, but, but begins to move what they feel is in the spirit it's like a bucket of cold water falling on you yeah. because it's not spiritual it's more fleshly in itself it says believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone into the world let me say this and I don't want to be mean and I don't want to be uh, detrimental to other churches but let me hear you let me tell you this right now if we're not careful I'm trying to be careful how to word this because I, I don't say nothing's wrong with what they're doing in a way, but light shows and smoke shows do not take the place of the spirit and the smoke and the fire of God. Does that make sense? Come on now. Does that make sense? We as a church have to understand that it's the spirit that does things. I say it all the time here at church, our, our praise and worship team does a phenomenal job. If you've never been to hear them, get online just to hear them if nothing else. But they're not entertainment. They're to lead us into worship. They're there for a show and they're not up there to to, 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 to us. It's not a concert. 
And I know I'm stepping on some toes right now, and I'm sorry, but the fact of the matter is, you've got to understand that everything that says it's of the Spirit may not be of the real Spirit. It's probably got a Spirit, but it's not the real Spirit. And it could be a fleshly Spirit, and it could be anything of that nature. But we're to try the Spirit's. And the way you know is through the word and the way you know is through your own spirit and your relationship with God. Can I say this? And I'm, I'm not going to pick on anything. The fact of the matter is, I see people leave churches because they follow after where they feel the hype's at, where they think the spirit's moving when it really may not be the spirit that's moving. Can I say that? If you, let me say this. If you're in a church and your church is maybe struggling, or its numbers are down or whatever, I encourage you, if the Spirit of God is moving in that place and that pastor or that preacher is teaching from the Word of the living God, hang in there just for a moment. You can be the catalyst that brings that Spirit back where it needs to be. Amen? Just hang on there for a moment. Don't jump ship and run. Just hang on there for a moment. Amen? Any questions, any comments so far? You got anything here? No. Good. All right. I know it's a little tough this morning. It's going to be tough through these churches. Acts chapter 20, uh, 20 and 30 says this, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the, all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, Paul's writing this, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, or uh, Paul's talking about this, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Paul was telling Timothy, and there's a letter in Ephes to the church of Ephesus at one time, and he says, Thou hast borne my name, or borne everything for my namesake, and has not fainted. And here's the thing is, he's saying, you've got to understand that these spirits are coming. False teachers may be coming. We've got to be careful about false teachers, and I think that's why we've got to learn to try the spirits. Everything that glitters is not gold. Everything that shouts is not necessarily the spirit. Everything that runs the aisles is not necessarily the spirit. Everything that, that lifts up holy hands may not be necessarily the true spirit. We've got to learn to test the spirits. And time does that sometimes. You understand? Time does that sometimes. But we'll move on from there since I stepped on a lot of toes this morning with that. It says, thou hast, thou hast uh, what do we say? Thou hast born for my name's sake and hast not fainted. These are good qualities for the church. The church ought to not, can't bear the evil. The church ought to try the spirits. The church ought to have borne and has patience for God's sake and has labored for his sake and has not fainted. He says, and think about that. He says, uh, not, you can't bear the, the wicked and you can't, you, you, can I say this about bearing and, and born? The church feels like it's under a lot of pressure right now. It feels like it's carried away. We understand that because we're, we're outside of our norm. Things are not happening but let me say this about bearing and working or, or, or having patience and for his name's sake labor. I want you to understand something today and, 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 and has borne, if you will. That would be like bearing, casting, you know, bearing a weight, if you will. Sometimes this is a weight of glory that comes upon a church and upon a pastor, and that's a whole different message. But the thing about it is, is we bear these things, and he said, these are good qualities. You, you're bearing the, the truth. You're, you're holding up for what's right. I said it the other morning, I preached a couple of weeks ago. It's time for us as the church to stand for what's true and to stand against what's wrong. Amen. Come on now, it's time for us to do that. And this church was apparently following into this suit and doing these things. And, and, and he says, you've got to understand because we can't just let any evil overtake the church. I, this is tough this morning. I'm just going to tell it like it is. Churches allow homosexuals into their sanctuary or into their leadership, not their sanctuary, but into their leadership. They're not doing these things. They're, they're allowing the evil to come into their church. I'm sorry. You may be offended to that. That's okay, but it's what Scripture says. Scripture says homosexuality is still an abomination unto God. If you've got a homosexual pastor in your church and they're, and they're out about that, I want you to understand something. The Spirit of God will not be in that church. Amen. Because he does not condone that. And we as men and women of God, we want everybody to come. Don't get me wrong what I'm saying, but we've got to stand against what's evil. We've got to stand against abortion. Come on now. We've got to stand against same-sex marriages. We've got to stand against pornography and fornication. We've got to stand against pedophiles. Come on. So I don't know who's out there, but you got we, we have to we have to uh, 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 not bear the evil that this world, we're going to be the city and the light upon the hill. And they say, well, that offends people. Well, that's okay. The Bible said this, Jesus said the cross will offend some. 
if I'm wrong, just call me out on this. If you don't stand against it, you stand for it. Correct? Well, could very well be. It's easy to be solid. It, let, let me say this, and, 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 and yeah, you, that's, 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 yeah, that's partially true, that's true, yeah. I mean, you, you got to be able to stand against it, whether you're out there holding up signs or whatever, but in your own spirit and in your own soul and in your own well, thought I, process. I'm not know. saying you got to stand on the street sure. and hold a sign. Right. But, but you you've, got, you've got to stand against it. That's you've right. got You've got to say, I am not for abortion. I'm Correct. not for for anything in the Bible that strictly says, do not do this. You've got to stand with the Bible. That's right. That's right. You're right. Absolutely. Okay. That's right. There used to be an old country song. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. That's right. <laughs> so, but these are some hard teachings and you're right. If you, you have to stand against it and the church has to stand against it. And, and not that we don't love those people and want those people in. That's not what we're saying. Because if you've had an abortion, God understands. Come on. He's, he's a forgiving God. If you if you are in a homosexual lifestyle, come on in. God will deliver you and set you free from that and forgive you. I, I believe that without a shadow of a doubt. If you are into pornography and fornication and adultery and all those things that we know that the Bible teaches again, come into the house of God, hear the word, and let the spirit begin to change you and move you. But as a church body, we have to accept those and love them. That's where the patient comes in. That's where we got to be patient, but we have to stand for what's right and we have to stand against what's wrong. And he says, you have labored for my name's sake and has not fainted. I think that's an important part right there, has not fainted. How many ever felt like throwing in the towel? I'm done. I quit. I thought what a great thing this church has done. Not fainted. Not gave up. Hear me preachers today. Don't give up. Pastors, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Sunday school teachers, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Juan Morton says we could stand against it, but still love them and be a light for them to follow follow and want. I think what she's saying, want, want what we have. Absolutely. If I'm wrong about, about that, I uh, wanted to please uh, type in again, but I think that's what she's meaning. That's right. right. You're right. We have to be the light. We have to love them. People love us. Come on. Sue Muncy says... When we go to church, we are going to his holy place to be alert, uh, to, to the altar, at the altar. I need some new specs. To his holy place at the altar. Yes. Right. There you go. You're right. Absolutely. That's great, Sister Sue. That's, a, that's true. And we are going to his holy place. And this is his place. He's in the midst of this. And, and that's our job to bring. A pastor said this once, you know, we're here to, to refuel our tanks. Yeah. But our main job is to bring in every single person that you just mentioned. Right. Uh, every sin that, that, that we find out there in the world, we're supposed to be inviting them in. Right. You know, the, 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 the gay, the lesbian, the, the murderer, no matter who it is. That's right. Because you can't take the altar to them every single time, but you can always bring them in here. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hey, and that's the thing. And here's the thing is, it, it's standing against that means really, I guess, we'll put it in a nutshell, it's, it's sound doctrine. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about doctrine, but uh, Paul wrote in Timothy, he says, the, the word of God is for reproof, correction, and sound doctrine. Amen. And doctrine really means you've got to stand on some things. We here at the Church of God have what we call 14 declarations of faith, and those are some immovable things that we stand upon, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. He was born of a virgin. He died and rose on the third day. And just to, that's just to name a few. We've got to stand on some sound doctrine. It's like y'all you, are saying out there, and Brother Jerry's talking about, if the word of God says thou shalt not, that's what it means. And, 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 but we've got to do it in love. And I like what you say. We've got, to, we've got to be the light for them. Somebody was the light for me. I may have not been in those areas that I named off, but I, my sin was just as great as their sin. I was just as lost as they were. I ain't telling you because you probably wouldn't listen to me no more. <laughs> my, sin, my sin was no less than their sin in, in the eyes of God we were all doomed and going to hell but somebody was a light for me somebody stood their ground and said brother this is sin and you do it in love and I think that's an important thing Go ahead. Wendy Peacock and I love what she wrote here hate the sin not the sinner and we are going to see our churches flooded with all walks of people and, and she Absolutely is totally right. true there we have to love them and continuously point <clears throat> them to the light. 
and and she's spot on. That's that's a hundred percent true. Hey, that's true. I, tell, I, was, I was preaching the other morning, and, and if you're seeing me preach, I kind of got tore up, and a big thing hit my mind, and it still resonates with me to this morning, is that there's going to be people coming in here that don't dress like us, they don't talk like us, they don't act like us, they don't smell like us. They're going to come in, and they just, and, and, and I believe she's right, there's going to be a flood of people come in, and we got to be ready for them. We've got to teach the Word of God, we've got to teach sound doctrine, but we do it in love, and but she's right, point them to the light. Can I say this? You know what we really are? And you know what I am? I'm just a beggar showing another beggar where the bread of life is. Amen. That's it. I'm just a beggar showing another beggar. Just come on in. You, you, you got you to taste this. You got to try this. And that's what we are. You know, I, I'm going to tell on you. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, Cut him off. <laughs> I, uh, you, you and I have been talking this past week. It, you know, even though I was on vacation, I, I was working a little bit. So I, I was having a little fun. Um and, and, and he told me some plans about what we were going to be doing here pretty soon. And one of the things that he was going to do is try to get both of us out there in the world to start telling everybody, when you get off work, just come on to church as you are. Wear your work clothes, the firemen, the policemen, the nurses. Come as you are. It does not matter what you look like, what you smell like. It does not matter how, what your hair looks like. Come as you are. You know, a lot of times people look at, at the preacher and, and the, the deacons and everything and they see in some of the other churches that they're all dressed up in a three-piece suit and everything. I, I, I want to say this and please, if you don't like what I say, just, just you know, get in touch with him. He'll correct me. But God does not look at your suit. Right. He does not look at your dress. He looks at what's on the inside, at your heart. And he wants more and more of you to come inside his house. He wants you to be a part of his church. And that, that's our mission over these ne- next few months, years, until he, he busts the eastern skies open. There you go. And that's the key. Uh, and he's right. Uh, there's one good thing about Mount Vale. If you never, excuse me, if you've never been here, you may be, you'll see a guy in a three-piece suit standing beside a guy in a pair of overall. Come on. And you're like, well, that's crazy. Well, it might be, but... You know, God, he's right. God's not looking at the suit you wear. And, and I wear them because it's just the way I do it. But sometimes, sometimes I don't. But the point being is that he's right. You, we have to, as a church, invite people to come as they are. I'm a fisherman at heart, I guess. All our job is to do is to catch them. His job is to clean them up. Amen. And if you've ever been fishing, I'd rather do the catching than the cleaning. <laughs> it takes a lot of work uh, but the fact of the matter is the problem we have had in the past is we try to clean them before they came or before God had a chance to, to do his work our, our, our whole focus is to be fishers and men we talk a series on that you can go back and watch it it's to catch the fish it's up to God to clean them up and, and Jerry was talking more about their dress and more about their, their attire and, and we are we're, we're going to start encouraging especially for some of our services just come as you are. Some people work such odd schedules now, and we and, and the world is such in a, in a in a different place in itself. Can I say this? And I'm going to move from this subject, but I, I know of a lady one time that went to a church, and she was dropping her child off to go to like a vacation Bible school, and one of the ladies met her at the door, and told her I don't know if it was in this area, but said, "Ma'am, if you'd go home and put on a dress, you can come in here with your daughter." And I thought, man, how, how sad that was. They missed an opportunity for that woman to come. Come on. And I know as you, as you, as, as the Lord changes you and as your heart changes and things change in your life, you, you know what I'm saying? Don't, don't get me wrong what I'm saying. But the fact of the matter is she was a lost lady. She didn't know the Lord. She probably may not even own the dress. They said, let her in to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm just saying. Amen. Uh, we'll move on before I get too much trouble. But how many has ever, we were down at the bottom where it said they fainted not. Can I say this? It's easy to quit. It is. It's easy to quit. Anybody can quit. Anybody can throw in the towel. It takes a lot to persevere. It takes a lot to have patience. It takes a lot to more what needs to be weighted of the matter. It takes a lot to try the spirits. It takes a lot to stand for what's right and what's wrong. 
How easy is it to follow after everything that's going on? Just, oh, everything's good. Everybody's good. Everybody's going to make it. It's easy. It's hard to stand your ground and stand for the doctrine. I encourage you this morning not to faint, not to throw in the towel. Don't give up. The Bible teaches us, he says, he said, uh, uh, don't grow weary in well-doing. For one day you'll, re you'll, you'll reap your reward. The, the, these, this church had some great qualities in it. Had some great qualities in it. And I'm going to hit this, and I'm, I'm thinking we may get through. We may go a little longer this morning. If that's all right with everybody. But man, I like what y'all are saying. You, you, you guys are spot on before I go too far into that. We as a church have to. We have to hate the sin. That's what got us saved is we understood we were sinners. And the only way we understood we were sinners is because somebody told us about the word of God and what the word of God said. And the word of God began to penetrate our heart as the spirit began to draw us. But we don't hate the sinner. We're to love everybody. There's an old little song, red or yellow, black and white. It don't matter. Rich, poor, young, or old, it don't matter. Drug dealer, dope dealer. I don't go too much in y'all know what I'm saying. It don't matter. We're to love them. We're to, we're to invite them in to the house of the living God. We're to share the gospel, even if they don't come in here. We're to take the church to them. We've talked about that before. Any more comments on that subject before I move too far? All right, verse four. Now. Here's where the rubber meets the road. And this is the hard part about this church. This church was doing some good things. They were working for the Lord. They were patient for the Lord. They were laboring before Christ. They were, they were standing against what was wrong. And they had tried the, 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 the spirits, if you will, and, and, and had not even fainted. But then Jesus says this, nevertheless, nevertheless. I looked that word up. It means in spite of. In spite of all of what you've been doing, he said, I got somewhat against thee. <laughs> we weren't expecting that, were we? If you're reading that, you're thinking, okay, this church is going good. And God says, wait a minute. I got something against thee. He said, because thou hast left thy first love. Just to add this note, I think it's important that what we've been saying and what people have been commenting on. We have to stand on sound doctrine and we've got to stand on the word of the living God but we've got to do it in love. Think about this. He says you've left your first love. 1 Timothy 5 and 12 says this. Can I say this? Here's, here's what's happening. The church is so busy doing the right things they forgot who they were doing the right things for. Amen. Men in particular, I'm going to pick on men this morning. We are, we are, we are at fault sometimes to our own self that we're trying to provide for our family, make sure they got the nicest cars, the nicest house, the nicest swimming pools, the nicest motorcycles, the nicest forerunners, the ni nicest sea dudes, and we're working hours upon hours upon hours upon hours, and we're missing out on what we're really working for. Can I say this to daddies and moms? Your child would rather have your time than it would have a new telephone. Oh, hallelujah. We forget that we're working because we love them, but we don't have that that, that relationship that. connection is so much more important, if that makes sense. And here's what's happened with this church. I call it the Martha syndrome. You Bible readers know what I'm talking about. Mary and Martha was, was in their house, in Lazarus' house. Jesus was there. Mary was at Jesus' feet listening to him. Martha was right all about running around trying to make everything happen. She comes to Jesus and said, Jesus, let's just paraphrase Get Mary up and tell her to come help me. Jesus is Martha. You're worried about other things, not important things. What I want to say here is you need to work for the Lord. You need to have all these qualities, but do not let it ever supersede your relationship and your time along with Jesus. He said they've almost like casted off their first faith, as they will. Their first love. Ephesians 1 and 15, Paul was writing to them. And he's writing before all this took place. He said, Wherefore I also, after I heard love unto all the saints. He was telling them about the their, their warm of their love and, and things that let the love of Christ and the relationship with him as a church be overtaken by orthodoxy, if you will, religious 
works, if you will, to fulfill what they, they've left that love. Does that make sense? They were working, they were laboring, they were doing all this, but they were not had the right relationship. They had lost the relationship, if you will. They had walked away from Christ. Can I say this? Don't ever, I said it, but I want, I want to stress this. Don't ever let the things you do supersede your relationship with Jesus. They were neglecting their relationship with Jesus. The zeal they had at their first, when they first got, how many, how many can remember when you first got saved? You couldn't wait to get to the house of God. Come on, man. You couldn't wait to worship. You didn't care what songs they were singing. Come on. You didn't care if it came out of the red back or off the wall. You didn't care if it was contemporary, fast, slow, young or old. You just wanted to get into the presence of God and you wanted to worship Him. I'm afraid sometimes we as a church, I'm talking to church folks this morning, we that have been in the face so long begin to nitpick stuff and we were working for God. We've got, a, we've got a zeal to do a work for the Lord. But we get so hung up on little things. And I'll tell you why people get hung up on little things. This is my personal opinion. is because they're losing the right relationship with Christ. Amen. They're, they're neglecting the love they had. How many remember when you first met your wife or your husband? You couldn't, you couldn't, you talked to them for hours on the phone. If we're not careful in our marriages, it's an example. We begin to get used to each other. We begin to become complacent with each other. And we don't talk as much as we used to. Come on. Can I say this? I can't, I can't remember who told me this. But I thought it was a good rule of thumb, especially to men. Listen up, men. And women, I guess. But he was talking to a bunch of men. He said, what it took to get her, it takes to keep her. Come on, man. That's just marriage one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> and my perfect daddy, probably not. My wife, hopefully she's not on there. <laughs> but what it, takes to, what it took to get her, it takes to keep her. And what it took in your first relationship with Christ. Can I say this? We lose that zeal. We didn't, can, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be mean this morning. Is that all right? When we first got saved, we didn't care what seat we sat in when we come in. We didn't even have a favorite seat. We didn't have a favorite parking place. We just felt was. And, 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 and this church in itself was losing that love, first love, if you will. If we are not careful as men and women of God, we grow complacent. Can I say this? If the Spirit of God moves in your church, don't ever take it for granted. Don't ever get complacent. Don't think it's always the norm. You know what I'm saying? God moves, moves in mighty ways. But if you're a Mount Valley and you're listening or you go to another church and the Spirit of God's falling in that house, don't get so complacent when the Spirit of God falls that you're walking around to your neighbor talking about what you're going to do for lunch. Yeah. I'm glad you know my ears. See, y'all can't throw rocks at me when you're on the internet. You can cut me off. That's about it. But we're not to neglect our first love. This church had a love for people and, and, and they had a warmth that, that had given place, if you will, to to uh, uh, just going through the motions is really what we're talking about. They were doing great works and they were so busy in these works that they were neglecting their relationship with him. Can I say this to pastors and preachers? Sometimes we're probably one of the worst to do that. No. We're visiting, we're going, we're trying to fix this fire, put out that fire, fix that schism and that ism, and we're over here, we're over there, and we got pokers over here, we got fires over here we're trying to put out, we're going to the hospital over here, we're going over there, we got that person, we got to do a wedding, we got to do a funeral, we got to do a baby, and then we're forgetting our own relationship with him. He's the reason we do all this. As husbands, that's the reason we go to work, is to provide for our family. But don't ever forget what you're providing for. Don't ever forget, don't neglect those relationships. And that's what he's telling this church. You're doing some great things. He said, but you, you, you're forgetting about me. You're forgetting about the relationship with me. The Bible teaches us a very simple process. If we lift him up, he said, if I'm high and lifted up, he said, I'll draw the man and women. Lift me up in everything that you do. Any comments, any questions before I get in too much trouble? <laughs> that no, no you're, you're doing good. <laughs> Jerry's on the other I, side. He's, you're doing good. He's like, oh, well, I got you back. I mean, back here. <laughs> I, I'm the cheerleader over here. You ain't heard me, me complain at all. Keep going. Think buddy. about this. Love. <laughs> Jesus said this. Let, let, let's just look at this real quick. Matthew 22 and 37. Jesus says this. Jesus said, and, and they asked him what the great commandment was. And he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. 
This is the first and great commandment. And second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws of the prophets. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 13. Bible readers know it's the love chapter. He says, although I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, which means have not love, he said, I'm nothing. How will they know that you're my disciples? Well, you have love one for another. I thought about that. Sometimes we lose that zeal. We lose that first love. People get hung up on songs. People get hung up on who's singing. People get hung up on preaching. Can I say this? Every church I'm into, it's called a thing called pastoritis. If pastor ain't there, people don't show up. Preacheritis, if this ain't preaching, I ain't coming. Come on now. Can I say this? When you were a first Christian, you didn't care who was preaching as long as they was bringing the word. You didn't care who was singing as long as they were singing about Jesus. Right? Amen? Yeah, off the quiet. Jerry even got quiet. What I'm trying to say is, is that's your first love. You didn't care what was, you didn't care. As long as they were teaching about Jesus, as long as they were preaching about Jesus, you didn't, like I said, you didn't have a favorite parking place, you didn't have a favorite seat, you didn't have a favorite preacher, you just wanted to be where Jesus was. Can I say this to church people? If we're not careful, we get so busy doing other things. And they're good things, they're great things. Don't get me wrong, you gotta work for the Lord. We, we've talked about that before. They were doing super things. He said, but nevertheless, in spite of all that, he said, you left your first love. You're getting further and further away from me. And that's who you're doing it for in itself. Amen? Got a comment here? Any questions? Everybody got quiet out there. No comment other than used to. We didn't have a quitting time. Didn't watch our watches. Mm -hmm. Didn't care how long we was going to be out there. Yeah. Didn't have a time for quitting uh, what used to be just going to, uh, I forget what grandma used to call it, but it wasn't Sunday school. It was Bible class or, or something like oh, that. Yeah. I, but it wasn't called class. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Sunday school. If you got Sunday school, you need to have one. Find yourself in one. Hey, Jerry. He's whispering over there. No, that's his phone. <laughs> I have no idea. I got a new phone, guys, and that's the reason I'm having so much trouble. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, let's move, okay? We understand the love part, I believe, and we understand that we're not to lose our first love. They say that 30 years had probably elapsed from Ephesians 1 to the book of Revelation when Paul wrote that first epistle about their love and their love for Christ and their love for the people and other men. And that's what we were talking about, that you had to have love for those who are, you, you got to love the sinner and not the sin. They were standing against it, but were they were really loving the people. And then verse five says this, I know we're running short of time, but it says, remember thou from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. We, and he's telling me, he said, just repent. It's okay. We all, we're all humanity. We all stumble. We all fall. We all get caught up in the life and in the world. He said, repent. They must inwardly grieve, if you will. Repent means to turn away from your sin. Repent means to turn away from that. And then not to, it is to have a, a, a legitimate grieving, if you will, or a, an inward uh, thing to understand that, it, that it's you. It, you know, sometimes we, we hear it all the time. People just didn't really come to the altar and really got saved. They, they didn't want to be forgiven. They just want to be, uh, didn't want to, they wanted to just, they were, it's like being in jail. They were not sorry for what they were doing. They were just sorry they got caught. And that's not repenting. Repenting is sorry for what you've done. And, and, and then you go to that and he says, you must return to do your first works. I, I like what uh, one of the commentaries, I can't remember which one it was. He said, they must, as it were, in, uh, begin again, go back step by step until they come to the place where they first took that false step. He said, we must endeavor to revive and recover our first zeal, our first tenderness, our first seriousness, our first love, our first walk, honestly, and watch as diligently as we did when we first set out in the ways of God. We become complacent. It happens to us. And he will think about it. Then he says, if you don't do this, he said, I'm going to come quickly and remove the candlestick. We understand the candlestick represented the church out of its place. 
church them, if you will. I will take away the candlestick and move it to another location. I'll take the church and move it. That's a, that's a sobering thought. That he'll move. Come on. He'll remove it. That's what he told him. He said, you got to get it right. He says, or, or in the church, the church, if you will, that we know it will be moved. He said, he said, I will take away the church from Ephesus. I'll remove it elsewhere. I'll put it in another place. And it's a removal of the candlestick, not the extension, or the extend, extend, extension, extension, I can't get it out. He wasn't going to extinguish the candle, but he was going to remove the candlestick, which is, which is threatening. And, and that's what we've got to understand. It's the seat of the church that'll be changed, but the church itself will survive. He'll move it to another place. He'll move it to a different place. He'll go, he'll take it to somewhere where they're feeding. He says, what the, I like what this one comment here says, what the East has lost, the West has gained. And, and, and it makes sense to that sense. But then he goes, time a little bit, but he says this in verse six, but thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also have. He tells them what great things they're doing. He tells them what he has against them. Now he's saying something else great about them. And the Nicolaitans, I wanted to stop here just to give you a little brief history on them. The Nicolaitans were a sect, if you will, or a loose sect that kind of tried to roll themselves under Christianities, who deeds were strong and condemned. They were held to the doctrine of Balaam. And the doctrine of Balaam was, was that they would, uh, was, uh, they, they uh, ate what, sac what, what was sacrificed. They said it was lawful to eat what was sacrificed to idols. They committed fornication. And, and that, that's what they taught. They would become a stumbling block into the men and women of, of God in itself. They would at times be even in the, I don't know how else to say it, in the temples of Diana and things like that. They had orgies and things of that nature. They had temple prophet, prophetesses or, or the, of Diana and they were really harlots of that day. They were, they were prostitutes of that day. And they, just, they were saying that it's lawful to do all those things. It's okay if you do those things. You can be a Christian and do those things. How many know that the world we live in today say you can live any way you want and still make it to heaven? Come on now. Yeah. They say you can be a homosexual and you're going to make it. You can be an adulterer and you're going to make it. You're going to be an alcoholic and you're going to make it. You're going to, you can dabble in pornography and you can have sex outside of marriage and you're going to make it. But the Bible teaches, it says, all those shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Nicolaitans, and that's what they hated. And I think it's a great thing. The church has to stand, has to stand and preach the truth. Here they are again. But to understand what the Nicolaitans were, they they were they were saying you could eat uh, from the from uh, uh, sacrifice to idols, and in that day, it doesn't seem too important to us because we eat everything. Well, some of us do, uh, but anyway, at that time, idols was almost like you believed in that idol, and if you didn't eat of that, then there was persecution that come against you. Go ahead. Pastor says that's uh, hyper -cal Calvarism today. Hyper Calvarism. Cal Cal Calvinism. Okay, it was hard enough for me to say. Yeah, let's just let it go. <laughs> Calvinism. Calvinism. That's there you name. go. It is. And that's where they are. That's what the Nicolaitans were. Yes. And, and they were saying, you can just do these things and it's okay. And, you know, it was it was, and it was bad enough, you know, that they, they tried to mingle themselves with these idolatrous feasts at that time. And we see that today in ourselves. And he says, you've got to stand against this thing. I want to say this. You can't do anything you want and go to heaven. That's what the word says. Brian Lamas says, First John 1 and 6, King James Version, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie mm -hmm. and do not the truth. And that's exactly what we were saying earlier. Absolutely. You know, it, 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 basically, if you, if you don't do what Jesus or the Bible says, you're going to be in darkness because right. he's going to turn his eye to you. That's right, and he's right. You can't, the Bible says you can't serve two masters, and that's a fact. You can't do those things. God is, God is a jealous God, and God has boundaries, if you will. God has rules and laws and things. He's a holy God, and an unholy person cannot be in this. That unholiness can't be living in the same place. Sin can't be in the same place of a holy God. It will be destroyed. And that's true. You can't do those things. If you're, you can't say I, I'm, I'm a child of the light and go out and do the things of the world. It, 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 he's right. That John said there. He said you're lying. Yeah. And, and you're right. And, 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 but as our pastor said, that's that's a thing that's been taught throughout, especially in the South. I don't know about other places that you can do anything you want, make it to heaven. And the world is trying to teach that you can do anything you want, make it to heaven. But that's not true. 
pastor put in here, Romans 6 and 1. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6 and 2, God forbid. How shall we that... Sorry about that, guys. Uh, God forbid, how shall we... Uh, somebody that that are dead in sin live any longer therein. There you go. I can't I I can't click on it. My that's right. That's wrong. John. That's uh, right. Live any longer therein. Yeah. Uh, and then Sue Munson says, God is trying to wake us up now. We are as a nation and she is right. Maybe. We all do. You know what this you know what this country needs is more God. <laughs> and you're right, Pastor, that's right. He, Paul was writing a rhetorical question there. He says, "It's in great time more." He said, "God forbid." He says, "He says that that only make no sense." Is what he's saying. If he's in the south. He said, "Boys, that don't make no sense at all." How, how many has ever heard the old terminology "greasy and grace"? Pastor may can remember, but there's one preacher on TV said, "The more you sin, the closer you get to God." That ain't right. <laughs> so that ain't what the Bible teaches. That that is not true. Because the fact of the matter is, grace abounds. Thank God for grace. Thank God we do stumble, we do fall, but we're not to live in sin. The Bible teaches us, I believe it's in Hebrews, he said, if we willfully sin, come on, think about it. And, and that's the key is, is today we're being taught that you can do anything you want. We're being taught that there's other ways to get to heaven. And, 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 and this, this, this Nicolaitan thing, and this was great that this church stood against this, and you'll see that throughout this, some of this uh, other churches, we understand that, that these doctrines were unsound. And, and, and here's the thing is, these are false prophets. I don't know how else to cut it and slice it and dice it, but these are false prophets that are sneaking into the church. And, and we, we use this a lot because it's being propagated a lot. It's, on, it's, it's before us every time we turn around anymore. But there, my, I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, you know, some homosexuals think Jesus is okay with their lifestyle. Well, Jesus ain't okay with your lifestyle. I want to say this in love. Jesus wasn't okay with my lifestyle. Okay? He says that's an abomination of him. That's a sin. And what was a sin when he wrote the scriptures? What was a sin when he said it was a sin? It's still a sin today. God has not changed his mind on this. And these prophets, if you will, the Nicolaitans that were coming in and leading the people astray. That's what the, 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 the doctrine of Balaam was. That they become a stumbling block. That's all he did was become a stumbling block to the children of Israel in the wilderness, if you will, when they were coming over. And that's what he's saying. These Nicolaitans are a stumbling block saying everything's okay. I like what our pastor's saying and, and Brother Layman's saying that these, we, we can't, you just can't do that. And it doesn't work that way. And we see it that these Nicolaitans, it, it was the deeds for them. It was the things that they done. It was their character that they were bringing false teachings into the church and they were bringing false teachings into I'm going to be kind as I can. If you're allowing those things to happen in your church, as far as your leadership, let people come in, come as they are. God will change them, God will clean them. I'm not talking about people who just come and sit in, in your church. Homosexuals can come to our church, but they're not going to be in leadership. They're not going to be able to teach. They're not going to be able to preach. They're not going to be able to sing. We're not going to condone what they do no more than, than a guy that's that's living with, a, with his wife, that's living with somebody that's not his wife. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? No more than an alcoholic. God has to save them and God has to sanctify them. God has to change them. And if you're allowing that to happen, you're allowing that spirit of the Nicolaitans and you're allowing that spirit of Balaam, if you will, to enter into your church. Amen. Help me, Pastor. Help me out. Second Peter 2. There are false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. Everything that withers, not gold. Try the spirits. Try it with the word. That's what you're based on, the word of God. If it don't line up with that word, then I got news for you, it don't line up with nothing. I lost my place. Who probably shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. Jesus said, Here, this is for the churches, and this is for ourselves. We've got to understand we can't live any way we want to make it to heaven. We, the spirit of the Nicolaitans, or if you will, or that, that sect, if you will, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, we say you can do all those things, and God will say it's okay. But I got news for you, God doesn't say, God does not turn a blinded eye to sin. 
Amen. John Crosby says, Amen, brother. If it was a sin then, it's a sin now. The Bible did not change just because we, we, we got it reprinted. Just because politics changed. That's right. Just because man's views changed. Just because a woman decided it was okay. <laughs> You're right, sister. The <laughs> Bible didn't change. The Bible ain't going to change. He said that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will last forever. forever. If you want a God stick, get the Word of God. That's what we're teaching. That's why we're getting into this. Why we got this Bible study. Get into the Word of God. Any more comments before I move? No. Think about this in, in verse 6. He said, I hate those. God said, I hate them. He said, you hate them and I hate them. He said, wait a minute. God hates them? <laughs> God don't hate them, but he hates the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You've got to understand this. And then that's what we're talking about. You've got to understand, we, we as people don't hate the sinner, but we have to hate sin. I have to hate sin so much that I don't do it. Come on. I just lost my place. All right, move to verse 7. We're going to move. We're running out of time. He said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. I guess we all got ears, hopefully. But I think it's more talking about spiritual ears. He's talking to the church. What the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which was in the midst of paradise. Jesus is talking about him that overcometh. How many knows that we are overcomers? Amen. We can be overcomers. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. He that overcometh. And he said, and he gives a promise. He said, he that overcometh, I will give thee to the tree of life. This is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life and the water of life go together in the scriptures as you will see later on, both implying the living with God eternally. In paradise of my God, the word in the earthly paradise, we, we saw that there was the tree of life in the garden of Eden, and there were no other trees in this paradise of God, if you will. We see it in the, in the tree of life, and then there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil at the beginning, but in this, in heaven and in paradise, we only see the one tree, and that's the tree of life. He's saying if you'll overcome these things, church, if we'll overcome these things, we got to do the works. We've done, the church is doing great things, but don't ever lose your first love with Jesus Christ. That first always have. And the way you do that is through your prayer life. The way you do that is through worship. The way you do that is through church attendance. I'm just going to be honest. Sunday school, Bible reading, praying, worshiping God. You keep that kindled fire going and that first love going, the love for God and the love for others. And that's the love is what moves people. You know what I'm saying? The love is what God keeps teaching us over and over and over again. We need to stand on some sound doctrine. And we need to stand against the Nicolaitans. And we need to do that, but we've got to do it in love. The Bible says the love covers a multiple of sins. Amen? And he says, if the church will hear, if we'll hear, if we'll repent, if we'll turn from our ways and go to what we need to do, if we'll do those things, he says, and we'll overcome. He says, there's a promise for you one day in heaven. There's a promise that the tree of life, you'll eat from it forever in his paradise. I like this as the paradise of God, the place he went and built for us. Amen. Any comments, any questions, suggestions? No rocks? We good? I think we're good, brother. All right, well, we're going to wrap this thing up. I know we went over a little bit this morning, but there were some good things. You guys had some great comments. Thank you for commenting. And don't forget, don't lose your first love. Don't neglect the relationship with Jesus. And don't get too busy that you neglect the relationship with Jesus. Amen. Don't neglect it. And he says, if you have, then it's okay. Just repent. Go back where you come from. Don't forget where you fell from. And say, hey, I know where I did it. Let's, let's get it right. And then continue to do the works of the Lord. Continue to, to, to hate the Nicolaitan deeds, if you will, and continue to, to do great works and have patience and bear the weight and, and, and do the work of the Lord. And don't faint and don't get tired. So you get tired, but don't faint. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. So hopefully we, this church went pretty good and we'll jump into next week will be chapter two. We're still in chapter two, starting at verse eight through verse 11. We'll talk about the church at Smyrna. I guess that's how you pronounce it. That's how I pronounce it. <laughs> Is that pretty close? Smyrna. 
Uh, again, thank all those who are watching. Thank all those who participated this morning. Like Brother Jerry said, let people know that we're doing this. And, and he said he was he didn't he knew some even our leadership didn't know we were doing this. So uh, please let people know. Do watch parties, share what, whatever you want to do, or how you get the information out. Call them on the phone, text them, talk to them, see them face to face. We don't do that much anymore, but see them face to face and and all that. But for watching, thank you again for being part of this class. You all what makes this class possible outside of God Himself, and um, share it with somebody. And we're going to go into the church of Smyrna next week. So if you want to study those scriptures and uh, be ready for it, and we go from there. Uh, don't forget tonight's service. Don't forget our Sunday morning services and Sunday night encounter that's coming up, a night of worship on the twentieth, and. Uh, that's all. Is that everything? Go ahead, you get something. 8.15? Eight, eight yeah, the early service. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you preaching 8.15 this, this Sunday? I am. How about that? I you am. guys can see him at 8.15. Yeah, bright and early. Bright and early. With your coffee. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you got to get your coffee before you come again. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, we'll be there at the 8.15, the early service. So, uh, remember that. Uh, hey, if you don't have a Sunday school class, find you one. That's you right. got plenty. We've got one in the main sanctuary, or pastor teaches one over in the older sanctuary, or children's church area. And then, now, did you just call pastor old? You did. I did. Well, that's that's a given. I would call him old. Yeah. Pastor, you're old. He's listening. I ain't saying that, brother. <laughs> we love you guys. Yeah. Thank, uh, spread the word, if you would, please. We, we, we love you guys. Thank you for attending. Uh, we This is a, a great project. We're reaching out. Uh, to a lot of people, uh, believe it or not, we had uh, three people from uh, one from uh, South America, two from India on, on this oh. over the last few weeks. Oh. It, it's a great ministry. Thank you all from uh, from the bottom of our hearts and, and from the good Lord up above. Thank you for helping us uh, reach many, many people. Amen. Uh, with that being said, you got the closing words there, brother. All right. We'll see you next week. We'll be at the Church of Smyrna. <laughs> And uh, I pastor text something. I can tell Jerry cracked up over there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, thank you again. And, uh, you know, may God bless you. And don't forget Coffee in the Word next Wednesday morning.